Thank you, Clayton. Prayers of a pastor are also powerful and effective, and I appreciate it. Um, just a couple things. I love having a kindergarten teacher do the children's story. That's nice, right? You get a perspective. And, and also a kindergarten teacher who's a mother of young children. That's fresh, yeah. And thank you, Marie, for music this morning. One thing I want to say about Marie, she hasn't always sang that good. I just want you to know that. Part of family life, right? <laughs> First slide I have this morning. Um, this is the verse I, I, I have on a prayer card and I, I read on a fairly regular basis. Jesus says, and what's interesting about Jesus saying it in this text, 2 Corinthians, is that it's not one of the Gospels. It's not one of the, the places in Scripture, if you have the red letter editions where it's, it's red print where Jesus is talking, it's not the normal spot. It's in 2 Corinthians. Paul is writing here of what he heard, he sensed Jesus saying to him. He heard Jesus say, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness or brokenness. To me, that's powerful that he's being honest in his present struggle. He's naming that. I'd like to read that text in this. This is a little different translation. It's called the translator's translation. And until my buddy got it for me, I'd never heard of it either. So um, this is a take on this 2 Corinthians 9 passage. Paul writes, in order that I might not become proud or conceited because of the wonderful things that Christ has done for me, God permitted Satan to send a messenger to humble me. What Satan did to me was painful, like a thorn bothering my body. And don't miss this part. Three times, Paul writes, I prayed to the Lord about it begging the Lord to take it away from me. But the Lord said to me, no, I will not take this away from you. This is Paul talking. This is a hero of a faith. The Lord is saying to him, nope, you got to deal with it. You got to deal with it. The Lord said to Paul, no, I will not take this away from you. Instead, I will kindly help you and that will be all you need because it is when you are weak or broken or vulnerable that I can best work powerfully to help you. I don't always like that. don't always agree with it. But I find and draw some strength in suffering and difficulty from that text. Two quick things that I get from that text text this week is we all have things we have to endure. Can a brother get an amen? We all have things we have to endure, even if we've asked for them to be taken away. Second thing, take away from me from this passage, is Jesus helps us, especially when we're vulnerable or weak or broken, and especially when we let him. Amen? Amen? So I believe it's important to acknowledge each other. So I want to invite us to turn to the camera, acknowledge our brothers and sisters who are worshiping from a distance, and then also wave at the camera, and then wave at each other, acknowledging you're important, you're valuable. We're glad you're here. And brothers and sisters who are at a distance, just putting it out there, we have more space here. We've got some safe spacing, and you're welcome here too. And if, we, and if we need overflow, we have it in the community center as well. So next slide I have. How are you doing with your homework? Now, this isn't direct just to college students, okay? Because how many of you remember last week I gave you two pieces of homework? Okay, I see some hands. How are we doing with the homework? First one was is to make sure you express to your important people 
that you love them, to actually say, I love you. Anybody get that done? Okay, good, good. Um, was it harder or easier than you thought? So I want to encourage you, keep paying attention to that homework. Don't be like this little guy and let the homework get ahead of him. Second piece of homework was for married people or people who are in a relationship, you need to go on a date in the next two weeks. How are we doing with that? Okay, good. All right, I see some, some smiles. Oh, yeah, we're wearing masks. Now, you just know when someone's smiling with that. If you haven't done it yet, again, I encourage you to do that. And if you want to text me or email me and say, hey, got her done, and then with a big smiley face, because I'm assuming it's going to be good, right? So, so keep doing that. Kendra and I, on Friday, you know, we have a day off on Friday, so uh, we went to the, walked at the Arboretum, and we got some takeout that we just, just the two of us, it was good times, good times. Just wanted you to know, I'm, you want to know that the person who's giving homework is doing the homework as well, right? Um, and working on the I love yous. So don't forget to do your homework, especially if you haven't done it yet. So next slide I have this morning. So this relates to our theme today. I believe if we value, pay attention, and seek wisdom regarding life, our lives, family life included. We're doing this family life series through November. I believe we will receive help. I'd like to invite you to follow along on your device or your Bible um, back in Proverbs 2. And see if you can say amen to this slide as well. So the Proverbs writer is writing in Proverbs 2, verse 1. If you accept my words and treasure up my commandments within you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, if you indeed cry out for insight and raise your voice, for understanding, if you seek it like silver, and if you search for it like hidden treasure, Proverbs says, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. And I would say, for family life and for marriage, amen? If you're valuing it, if you're seeking it, if you're going for it. And then I love the next verse. For the Lord gives wisdom. I believe the Lord gives wisdom. And, and why not us, right? Anybody here want wisdom for your life? Why not you? Why not us? For the Lord gives wisdom for family life, for marriage, for whatever. And from the mouth, from the Lord's mouth, come knowledge and understanding. I believe this seeking for wisdom for family life is good for whatever stage of family life you're in. It doesn't just mean because you have little kids at home, or it doesn't just mean it's good for you when you're single. It's also when you're gray-headed or you're a grandparent or great-grandparent, because the issues never stop with life and family life. Amen? There's always something. So I believe wisdom from the Lord is a help. So today I want to give you three more things from, from John Drescher's book and, and my ideas. So I'm kind of intermingling these. But I give John and Betty Drescher credit. Um, I'm going to give you three more important things that I think that help marriage or family life uh, from their book, if we were starting our marriage again. So last week, just a little review, I named three things. Continue the courtship. Keep doing those things you did when you were dating your person. But also I tied into family life by saying, respect each other in the family. 
Second thing, I said, don't take your time with family for granted so much and plan to have quality time together. And then the third thing I said was communicate. Communicate and communicate some more. That's valuable, right? Because we don't always know why each other does or thinks what they do. So an additional one that I'm going to add, part of the new three today, is this next slide. Magnify each other's assets and minimize the liabilities. John and Betty Drescher write this. They write, if we were starting our marriage, and I would say in family again, the Dreschers write, we would pledge immediately to seek to magnify the good qualities for which we chose each other and minimize the worst traits which inevitably tag along. They write, this does not mean that we would not seek to improve and help each other overcome undesirable traits, but it does mean we would not allow these to become the center of attention and concern. That's great marital advice, right? That's great family advice. Magnifying assets and minimizing liabilities. Everyone and every relationship and every family has strengths. Now, in some situations, you've got to dig a little deeper to find them. Those are assets, things that are done well. Everyone and every relationship and every family also has weaknesses, growth areas, things they don't do so well, liabilities. You with me, friend? You with me? There is no perfect family. No perfect couple, even though we may project that on people, right? How many of y'all just projecting on that second row right there? Just the perfect little family. If you did, shame on you. We're a good family, but we're not a perfect family because there's no such thing. Church, we do well to put our primary energy towards the good the assets, and not the bad. But man, it's easy to look at liabilities, right? It's easy to focus in the family or in the dorm or an extended family. Wow, it's easy to focus on liabilities. Have you heard the saying, anybody, any jerk can criticize It takes a different kind of person to maximize the assets. Anybody can criticize. Not everybody can look at positives. The dresser's right. Some time ago, we shared in a delightful wedding Near the close of the ceremony, the bride and the groom asked those in attendance for advice as they began their marriage journey. The couple said, some of you have been married a long time. You have learned what is important for a successful and happy marriage. And we are now just starting out. What advice would you have for us? Among the numerous significant suggestions was one given by a grandmother. I believe your marriage will be happy, she said, if each day you share one thing you appreciate about the other. Can't go wrong with that, right? Now, we know in marriage that some of our spouses have lots of good qualities. So why do we focus on the negative, right? What's the saying? When I was teaching elementary school, we talked about 
always being positive with the elementary students. And, you know, some teachers are better at that than others. Right, Danae? <laughs> but one of the challenge was, if you were going to say something negative or critical of a student, it was important to balance that out with at least three positives. Three positives to every negative. So imagine if you had that goal in family life. Three positives to every negative. Imagine how marriages would be different if there were three positives for every negative. Imagine with siblings how that would be different if there were three positives for every negative. You know what? The world would be a different place. Amen? It would be a different place. Three positives for every negative. Hmm. Magnify each other's assets and minimize the liabilities. A second important thing in relationships that I want to add this morning is this next slide. The dressers say, be great in the little things. Be great in the little things. And so you see the picture there of Kendra and I riding bikes. We rode bikes this week. I just want to say, I haven't always been a, a huge bicycle helmet person. Because I figure if you're going to get hit, you're going to get drilled anyway. Why bother with the helmet? <laughs> Bad thinking, but you see I'm wearing a helmet there. Or the reflector vests. Like, come on now, if you can't see me, that's your problem. I'm going to get hit anyway. But it's a good idea, right? Especially when your spouse says to do it. <laughs> And it's important. I want to be great in the little things. And so sometimes that means doing things we don't want to do. Amen? And then as we do it, we realize, wow, that was really smart. Right? Hmm. Let me read what dressers wrote, you know. They wrote, we found it's the little things that will make or break a marriage. Most of us can manage enough muscle to handle the major things in life, such as accidents, financial failure, illness, death. When a marriage fails, it is because partners failed to practice the little kindnesses and to speak the little words of love. Little acts and words of love add luster and joy to life, whereas the absence of them causes coldness to creep in. The small neglects of love in time can become a tremendous collection of trifles which can tear two lovers apart. Be great in the little things. So I love sports. I love watching sports on TV maybe college football, pro football, I love to watch. And I remember one Saturday uh, in my first marriage, um, my spouse was cleaning. Saturday morning was, or maybe it was early Saturday afternoon. I was watching college football, and I was reclined on the sofa just enjoying the football game, and my spouse was cleaning like crazy. And I could sense some negative vibes from her. I mean, she's kind of jiving me, right? I'm watching the game. She's cleaning the house, right? Um, I don't know about you, but in our house, when one person is cleaning and everybody else isn't, there's usually tension in the house, right? That's what was going on there. And just a word of advice. I think when it's good to clean together as a family, right? The family that cleans together stays together, or at least fights less, right? Well, anyway, I'm sitting on the couch picking up this negative vibe from my spouse about cleaning. And, and, and so I decided I was going to move towards it instead of letting it come at me. And then I just was going to be in trouble. So I said, hey, what do we need to do today? And she started saying, well, we need to do laundry and then she named a couple. Then I said, hey, I'll do the laundry. I'll do all the laundry. She's like, what? You'll sort, wash, 
dry, fold the laundry, all of it? I said, yeah. So what came out of that was, that became my weekly chore. I did all the laundry for everybody in the house. And so when you have three daughters, that can be a lot of laundry, right? But I was able to make that work for me, did all the laundry, stayed in good graces with my spouse, and we kind of made what also evolved was that I was not going to be nagged by how much sports I watched because I was able to do the laundry to, to participate in what was going on. That was something that I could do. That was a little thing that helped in our family. Now, the question I have for you in your family situation, what are the little things that you can do that can be great? And that's not always going to be the same in the same place of life, same time of life. Because, you know, me doing laundry now isn't really helpful because, you know, teenagers need to learn to do their own laundry. Yeah, and, yeah, you do. <laughs> Just ask Marie. But what is it for you that can help you be great in the little things? Be great in the little things. Betty and John Drescher write this. When a marriage seemingly excuse me, when a marriage suffers seemingly sudden failure, it is really not something which is sudden. Beneath the surface for a long time, partners did not practice faithfulness in small things, which then lead to coldness, hard-heartedness, and hard-hearted leads to marriage breakups. And tragedy. So, just a quick word about marriage breakups or divorce, right? So, in Matthew 19, some Pharisees, some religious people come to Jesus and they're testing him. And they said, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause? First of all, I hate it when people ask. A good question, but in the wrong spirit. Because whatever your answer is gonna, just going to be wrong, right? And it reminded me, um, years ago, um, as a pastor, someone come up to me and they said, Pastor, what do you think of divorce? What's your stance on divorce? And I was glad for this Holy Spirit-led, simple response. I said, divorce stinks. Can a brother get an amen? It stinks. There's so much hurt all around. That's all I said. I think that's a little bit of what Jesus is saying. It's my take. They come to him and challenge him. Jesus answered. He says, have you not read? So he's kind of insulting these religious leaders. I mean, this was their thing to read and to know. And it's also from the Torah in the very early books of Genesis. Have you not read? Have you not read that the one who made them at the beginning, God the creator, made them male and female and said, for this reason... A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one. Jesus says, so they are no longer two, but one. And Jesus says, therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. But stuff happens. We neglect the little things. There's other things that happen. And a little bit later, they ask him, so why did Moses command us to give a certificate of dismissal to divorce? Jesus said to them, and here to me is a big issue. Jesus says, it was because you were so hard-hearted that Moses allowed you to divorce. Because from the beginning, it was not so. So my take is Jesus is saying, 
I want couples to work at it together. I want people to work at it together. And both of you have to work hard at it. Because if you're in a relationship and only one part is working, that's hard. It's difficult. Be great, my friends, in the little things. I also just want to read a paragraph of what it says in the Confession of Faith in a Mennonite Perspective. Some in the church experience divorce, abuse, sexual misconduct, and other problems that make marriage and family life burdensome or even impossible. And you know what? That stinks. That stinks. But there are some of us who've experienced that. And it's the strong and ones that keep stepping and keep living. And I love it when people can just continue to rebound and grow. The Confession of Faith continues, Jesus affirmed the sanctity of marriage and pointed to hardness of the heart as an ultimate cause of divorce. Today's church needs to uphold the permanency of marriage and help couples in conflict move toward reconciliation. Amen? At the same time, the church, as a reconciling and forgiving community, offers healing and new beginnings. Amen. The church is to bring strength and healing to individuals and families. I love that. I think that's strong. I want to do that. Because it was hard on me and hard on my parents when they divorced many years ago. It stinks. There's a lot of pain in that. So the third thing I'm going to share from Dresher's book, if we were starting our marriage over again, is this. They write, we would revel in the goodness and beauty of sex. So if you're not uncomfortable yet, <laughs> right? Talking about sex in church, what? All right, I got a little rumble of laugh. The Dresher's right. Our experience is that when marriage is good, caring, and loving, sex is good. And if love is not expressed in the other aspects of marriage, sex can become hollow, empty, and unsatisfactory. They write, yes, sex is significant in each marriage. It is meant to be good and satisfying and emotionally nourishing. So through the years, when I do uh, premarital counseling with couples, and that's a joy, I love doing that. Um, you know, one of the topics usually is sexuality and, and, and talking about um, aspects of sex with the couple, having them mostly focus on their communication, which is a huge thing, I believe, in, in having a healthy sex life. But it was always kind of fun for me um, when I would do a short wedding uh, message. So I talk about things to don't neglect in your marriage, you know, communication, spending time together. But it was always interesting how the audience squirmed when I would also tell the couple, don't neglect your sex life. Plan for it. Don't use up your energy all on everything else and then not have energy for each other. And it was interesting how the listeners, many would be like, whoo. But then there would always be a couple couples smiling really big and nodding their head and going, oh, yeah. Let's see what else the dressers write about sex. You're curious, aren't you? I'm having a little bit of fun. The dressers write, the unity we sense in sexual intimacy stems from how united we are in other things. Our openness and honesty in sexual relations tell how open and honest we are in the rest of our life together. The communication of our feelings and sex is closely related to the kind of communication we experience in all of marriage. You want to have a good sex life? 
talk. Be. So my single stepson is giving me gestures. <laughs> it's all right. So the love we feel, hey, you, it's, it's just me, but it's quiet in here. Even the kids are quiet. Wow, that's awesome. So I also want to say, um, I don't have a lot of time to talk about it. But it's important to just name that pornography is not something that helps a marriage. And we need to put that out there. There's, not, there's much that could be said about pornography, but there's not a lot of time for that this morning. But I, I'm going to say two things that I think are important that relate to this message in this series. The first one is, I believe it's safe to say pornography rarely helps your marriage and your sex life and the unity and the oneness that you have in marriage. And the second thing I would say, honest and open conversation about pornography or struggles in those areas are helpful and significant in marriage and family. Secrecy is an enemy, especially with regards to pornography. And I would say, look for and find places where you can have healthy discussions about sexuality and or pornography. Um, even if it's difficult for you, I think it's healthy. So Proverbs 2, towards the end of the chapter, I'm going to read verses 16 through 19. And if you just read it straight up, it looks like the Proverbs writer is picking on women. Because I think the issue here isn't just a woman issue. I'm going to switch it and use it both ways. Because I think it's more relevant for what we're talking about. <laughs> Proverbs writer and Jess Engel say, With wisdom... You will be saved from the loose woman or man, from the adulterer with their smooth words, who forsakes the partner of their youth and forgets their sacred covenant. For his, her way lead down to death and their paths to the shades. Those who go there never come back, nor do they regain the paths of life. I believe that can point to unhealthy perspective on sexuality and self and relationship. There's more that could be said about marriage, about family life. But listen to this part. The dresser's right. If we were starting our marriage again, would keep, we would keep in mind that sex is God's creation, and it's good, pure, and right, and to be enjoyed in the marriage relationship. They also write, so sex should be spoken about together freely and frankly until all attitudes of hesitancy and fear, shame and guilt are gone. Sex and marriage is to be fun and enjoyable and an enhancement in the relationship. Would you pray with me? Lord, help us revel in the goodness and beauty of sex. Help us make good decisions about temptation, pornography, etc. We need your help wherever we are in life. Lord, help us in marriage and family to be people who magnify assets and who minimize 
liabilities. For we know that can help our relationships. And Lord, I pray that you help us be great in little things and help us not to neglect these things. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.